The twins are doing great. They're doing great. It's wonderful. We are continuing in our sermon series this morning for the season of Lent entitled The Sin in the Room, inspired by the uh, situation that happened in Joshua chapter uh, Joshua chapter 7 with Achan who took the, uh, the spoil of war and hid it in the temple. And uh, I was sharing with the confirmation students this morning that there is a pattern for sin. We see it in uh, Eve. We see it with Achan. We see it with King David. We see it uh, all throughout scripture. There are multiple, um, multiple events and um, uh, scenarios or multiple stories of the same pattern happening where the, the sin is seen. You see the thing that you want, the tree of the knowledge, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the spoil of war for Achan. David sees Bathsheba. You see, you covet, you, uh, you take, and then you hide. That is the pattern. See, covet, take, hide. And the sin, once it's hidden in the room, Uh, needs to be exposed. It needs to be unearthed in order that it can be dealt with, in order that the the person in the community can be healed. And so we're looking at various sins in the room that the Lord is bringing to the surface in order that we might deal with it. And this morning, our text is Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, a well-known verse and uh, uh, text, a pericope, Uh, in which the Apostle Paul is making his way to the church in Antioch, or he's telling this uh, uh, this event to the church in Galatia, how he went to the church in Antioch. And Peter, who's named Cephas in the text, is confronted by Paul because of his sin and the things that he's doing that are not in accord with the gospel. Uh, He is confronted by the Apostle Paul. So our text for this morning is Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. Hopefully you have your Bible open there with me. If not, take a pew Bible, and I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew... How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the words of the apostle which have been preserved for our benefit. We thank you, Lord, for the courage of the apostle Paul who saw and read the situation rightly and spoke into it with courage and clarity, speaking a a word of truth, a word of correction in order that Even one of the pillars of the church, the Apostle Peter, might be restored to the work that you had called him to. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us now. Help us all to hear your word for us this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. My dear Wormwood... Obviously, you are making excellent progress. My only fear is in attempting to hurry the patient, you awaken him to a sense of his real position. For you and I know, who see the position as it really is, must never forget how totally different it ought to appear to him. 
we know that we have introduced a change of direction in his course, which is already carrying him out of his orbit around the enemy. But he must not be made to imagine that all the choices which have affected this change, of course, are trivial and revocable. He must not be allowed to suspect that he is now, however slowly, heading right away from the sun on a line which will carry him into the cold and dark of utmost space. For this reason, I am almost glad to hear that he is still a churchgoer. As long as he retains externally the habits of a Christian, he can still be made to think of himself as one who has adopted a few new friends and amusements, but whose spiritual state is much the same as it was six weeks ago. And while he thinks that, we do not have to contend with the explicit repentance of a definite, fully recognized sin, but only with his vague, though uneasy, feeling that he hasn't been doing very well lately. This dim uneasiness needs careful handling. If it gets too strong, it may wake him up and spoil the whole game. Steal away a man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in a dreary flickering of the mind over it, in the gratification of curiosities so feeble that the man is only half aware of them, in drumming his fingers and kicking of heels and whistling tunes that he does not like, or in the long, dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition. You will say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Signed, your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. That, of course, was an excerpt from C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. And I've always remembered the closing line of this particular letter. It seems to have been seared into my brain. The safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts, little by little, making the descent slowly and softly over the course of a lifetime until one day you realize you're in hell. Sin often does its work slowly. Soft underfoot, unnoticeable, incremental. We see a form of this very thing in our text for this morning. Peter, the apostle of the church, is slowly shrinking back from the Gentile dinner table. Slowly making his way into the background and making his way farther and farther into sin. That's in the text. And as we read the text, we see that the sin of compromise is the slow and subtle retreat from the godly standard. Just a little backing away, almost imperceptible. Nobody will notice until you're in the shadow, in the background. Since we live in Pittsburgh, I can share this line with you and you will all understand. The standard is the standard. 
The standard is the standard, as Coach Mike Tomlin likes to say. And that is to say that the standard is, at least for theological purposes, I don't know if Mike Tomlin means this, but this is what I mean, and this is what the scriptures mean. The standard is established by God. The standard is God's standard. Established by his command, established by his law. The standard is also hard fought and won by the Lord Jesus Christ himself through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. The cross is the standard. The standard is the standard. Compromise is the acceptance of of a standard that is different than what has been prescribed by God. So if God establishes the standard, then compromise is the acceptance of a standard that is different than what has been prescribed by God. And that difference is seen and experienced by one small step backwards. One imperceptible step away. The gospel is the standard. Paul restates the standard for the record in our text for this morning. Paul, as he enters into the situation and scenario that he finds himself at the church in Antioch, reestablishes the standard by saying, a person is justified not by works of the law, but by faith. Peter had an experience of grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who called Peter to himself so that Peter might believe. And Peter makes a confession in the Lord Jesus Christ and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter names Jesus as the Messiah. And in doing so, in receiving Christ by faith, he is set free from the law. Not only does Peter see Christ and receive Christ as the standard, later on in his apostolic ministry in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 and following, the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ gives to Peter a vision. If you remember the, the story of Acts chapter 10, if you remember the vision that Peter receives from Jesus, it is a vision of a ceremonially unclean meal that comes down from heaven... And Jesus commands Peter, take, kill, and eat. Peter says, no, 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 I can't do that. I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. And just like the denial, just like the restoration of Peter on the seashore, three times Peter says, no. And three times Jesus says, you eat. This is the standard Peter learns from the vision not to call unclean what God has made clean. That's the standard. And that includes food, but also the Gentiles whom Christ has come to save and to bring into the covenant community. And Peter is set free from the law. The Gentiles are set free from the law. And Peter is set free from ethnic and spiritual prejudice and is now walking and living in gospel freedom. He's not only walking and living, but he's eating. He's eating at the table of Gentiles. When all of a sudden, something enters the room. Fear. Fear walks through the door. Fear enters the room. Paul says that certain men came from James... This reference to James is most likely Jesus' own brother or half-brother by Mary and Joseph. These were representatives of the Jerusalem church. These were important men. These were men who were coming from HQ to inspect and to look around and to see how things were going in Antioch. And Peter, who's been eating at the seafood buffet table is now afraid of what leadership will think of what he's been doing. 
Peter doesn't appear to be living piously. He seems to be doing something that is quite not kosher. And someone might accuse him of not following the law, not being holy. And such accusations might affect his standing in the church. Such accusations might inhibit his apostolic ministry. And so now these men from James, they enter the room and they become the standard. The standard is no longer the standard. The standard is the men from James. It's no longer the gospel. It's no longer the word of God. It's no longer the vision that Peter received from Christ. But men... The men who are in the room. So what happens when these men enter the room? Peter starts down the gentle slope. Peter starts to back away slowly, incrementally, making his way into the background. Peter starts to separate himself from the table. Peter starts to set himself apart from his good Gentile company. Peter is tempted to isolate himself in order to protect himself. And by doing this, Paul said that Peter stood not only alone, but condemned. Peter, you're wrong. Peter, you are condemned. Peter, you are a hypocrite. According to Paul, Peter retreats into hypocrisy. According to Paul, retreat leads to hypocrisy. Now, what is hypocrisy? In modern culture, we have a particular prevailing definition of what hypocrisy is. We pick it up and we have a sense of it in our bones and in our lives. A hypocrite is someone who does not live up to his or her ideal. They don't live up to the standard. And as soon as we recognize that they don't live up to the standard, we say, you're a hypocrite. But that's a bad definition. It's not a biblical definition of hypocrisy. All of us fail to live up to the standard. There is no one righteous. No, not one. We are all sinners. Not living up to the standard makes us sinners. Not hypocrites. All of us are sinners, but not all of us are hypocrites. So what is a hypocrite? Well, in antiquity, hypocrisy was something else, something other than living up to the standard. A hypocrite was an actor, a play actor, a stage actor, someone who literally put on a mask in order to play a part in a performance, in a show, in a play. For a hypocrite, everything was not as it appeared. Hypocrisy, according to a biblical definition, is the concealing of one's true character, the hiding of one's thoughts and feelings under a disguise, which implies something quite different than what is true. A hypocrite, put simply, is a pretender. When you act hypocritically, you are masking your true convictions. You're masking your beliefs as you play a part. Peter was masking what he knew to be true about the gospel in order that he might be able to blend better in the crowd. Compromise is a retreat from the God-ordained standard that leads to hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is a form of pretending or acting that we engage in in order to please men. Compromise leads to man-pleasing, not God-pleasing. Peter found himself in a difficult spot. 
that required courage and conviction, but instead he compromised because it was expedient for him to do so in that moment. He was experiencing tremendously strong social pressure to separate himself from the crowd and to separate himself from the truth. Peter was afraid of reprisal by the men from James, and he didn't want to have to suffer the cost of standing on the truth. So he compromised. And Peter's compromise was contagious. It spreads from Peter and then to all the other Jews in the church of Antioch. And then finally, Paul says, to Barnabas. Even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas, who Paul knew. Barnabas, who was a close friend and ministry colleague to Paul. And it must have been personally very painful for Paul to see Barnabas compromise. But Paul confronts it. Nonetheless, he confronts the compromise. He confronts the sin in the room by naming the sin and calling out sinners. Paul confronts the sin by reasserting the standard that salvation is by justification through faith alone, not by works of the law. Paul calls Peter and Barnabas and the Jews of the Antiochian church to repentance calling them away from their belief that they had to remain ceremonially clean to be received by Christ. He calls them away from that and back to the sufficiency of Christ himself. And guess what? Peter comes back. Peter comes back. Barnabas comes back. The church of Antioch comes back. This is no small feat. The repentance of hypocrites requires strong medicine. Thomas Watson was one of the magisterial Puritans who wrote a short book called The Doctrine of Repentance. And in it, he describes the serious spiritual danger of the hypocrite. Hypocrisy, according to Watson, is a counterfeit faith. It is counterfeit to sanctity. The hypocrite is a stage player who dressed himself in the garb of religion. He pretends to a form of godliness but denies the power. The hypocrite is a saint in disguise. He makes a magnificent show like an ape clothed in fine purple. The hypocrite is like a house with a beautiful facade, but every room within is dark. He is a rotten post which is beautifully painted over. Under his mask of profession, he hides his plague sores. The hypocrite has but painted holiness. He is seemingly good so that he may be really bad. The hypocrite appears to have his eyes lifted to heaven, but his heart is full of impure lustings. He lives in secret sin against his conscience. He can be as his company is and act both the dove and the vulture. He hears the word, but is all ear. He is for temple devotion, where others may look at him and admire him, but he neglects family and prayer. The hypocrite feigns humility so that he may rise in the world. He is a pretender to faith, but he makes use of it rather for a cloak than a shield. He carries his Bible in his arm, but not in his heart. His whole religion is a lie. Hypocrites are in the gall of bitterness. Oh, how they need to humble themselves in the dust. They are far gone with their disease, and if anything can cure them, it must be by feeding upon the salt marshes of repentance. None will find it more difficult to repent than hypocrites. They have so organized in religion that their treacherous hearts know not how to repent. Hypocrisy is harder to cure than insanity. The hypocrite's abscess in his heart seldom breaks. Such as are guilty of prevailing hypocrisy. Let them fear and tremble. Their condition is sinful and sad. It is sinful because they do not embrace religion out of choice, but design. They do not love Christ. 
They only pretend. The hypocrite is compromised. And in need of repentance. The hypocrite needs to have their sin confronted just like the Apostle Peter, in order that they might receive anew the gospel. Hypocrisy is one of the sins in the room. But not the only sin. Like Peter, there is the sin of hypocrisy, but also the sin of compromise that precedes it, and the sin of man-pleasing that succeeds it, which all results from this subtle retreat from the standard. How many, how many of us have taken that small step? The sin in the room, then as it is now, is the displacement of God's standard for our own. The standard established by God is removed and replaced by what we think the standard of holiness ought to be. And that standard is typically not based upon the truth upon how we feel, what we think, what we believe. And when men and women violate that standard, when they violate our feelings, when they violate what we think is true and right and good, and away with them. The sin in the room is that when our standard is violated, we are far slower to forgive our brothers and sisters than God is. Peter sinned against Jesus Christ. Not once. Not only when he denied him three times, but he sinned against Jesus Christ when he denied Christ at the dinner table, eating with the Gentile church in Antioch. But when Peter was confronted with his sin, he repented and he was forgiven. He was restored. How often are we slow to repent? As Thomas Watson defines the slowness of every hypocrite. And how often are we slow to forgive those who do repent? Today we're not hung up on justification by works. That was the particular issue in Jerusalem and Antioch. It's a particular challenge in the Roman Catholic Church. We're not hung up by justification by works. We don't typically think that we earn our salvation through works righteousness. As evangelicals, we believe that we are justified to do no work at all. Repentance isn't necessary. We retreat from the table... As Peter retreated from the table, we retreat from the law altogether. We think the law has nothing to say to us. We are antinomians. We are against the law. We're gluttons at the table of Christian freedom and grace. We've gone from the gospel-centered life to the gospel-centered lie. All gospel, no law. And we think and we truly believe my actions, my decisions, my behaviors don't really matter as long as I believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins. As long as I say a sinner's prayer, my life can pretty much look indistinguishable from the world. We don't fear the circumcision party, but we do fear our friends, we fear our neighbors. We fear our colleagues at work. We don't want to look around and see that we're out of step with the prevailing culture at work or at home. We don't want to sound too fanatical. What is all this deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Jesus stuff? That sounds like a bridge too far. Ours is a sin of all grace, but no cross. It's all the benefits of Christ without the cost of discipleship. Rosaria Butterfield is a tremendous blessing to the church today. She's recently written a book, The Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. If you aren't aware of Rosaria Butterfield and her testimony of how she was called out of sin, as she was called out of lesbianism, 
and repented of that life and is now married with children. She has written a recent book called The Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. And one of the things that she says in the book that is simple and profound, she says, you can't bypass repentance to get to grace. We can't bypass bending the knee, bowing the head, putting out our hands and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Will you forgive me? But the good news is this, that through repentance, through genuine repentance, there is forgiveness. Forgiveness of compromise. Forgiveness of hypocrisy. Forgiveness of man-pleasing. Forgiveness of replacing the standard of God with our own. So today is the day. Now is the time. Jesus is calling. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we look to you. We thank you that you are calling us to a life of repentance, even as the Apostle Paul confronted the Apostle Peter. We thank you, Lord, that you confront us in our compromise, in our hypocrisy, in our man-pleasing. We thank you, Lord, that you confront us when we substitute the standard that has been given to us by your word for our own. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to live for you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.